Hello. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about chapter one for the introductory business statistics course. Um, so this is business 2305, and these are the notes for chapter one, sampling and data. So you see um, statistics bombards you all day, every day. You see it in the media, you see it on social media, um, you see it when you go into a store and see an advertisement. Um, statistics are always coming at you. And my goal for this class when you leave um, today is for you to be able to leave knowing how to be an educated consumer and educated voter. And what I mean by that is I want you to be able to see a statistic, something like four out of five dentists uh, prefer Crest toothpaste, and be able to analyze where that statistic came from and decide if it's a valid statistic, um, see if there's any biases that could have occurred, um, see how the study was done, look at the sampling method, all of those kind of things. So the first idea here is that there are two types of statistical methods. There's descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics are statistics like, um, <clears throat> are they come from a sample. So if you have a sample, we have what's called uh, sample statistics which come from actual data. And then we have inferential statistics. And so um, we often find population parameters when we're doing inferential statistics. And so that, the inferential comes from the fact that we infer or we estimate based off of a sample or sample statistics. Okay. <clears throat> So here are some key terms that um, you will need for this chapter. Now, I do not um, ever ask for you to regurgitate definitions to me. I want you to be aware that um, the only reason vocab is such an important part in this first chapter is so that you realize how to use the appropriate terminology for the subject and understand what I mean when I use the appropriate terminology. So a quick one run through of these. Population is the entire group of objects or people that we want to know about. We don't often have the ability to know about the entire population because it's usually too large to truly know, um, and it can often change as time goes by. So what we do is we take a sample of the population. And so that's a subgroup that usually that should represent the same represent the entire population. And so then we can collect data about the sample and use that data to find statistics. And we call those sample statistics. So those come directly from data that we know um, from our sample. And then often after that, we take the sample statistics and we do some estimation to find population parameters. So the parameters are um, the estimations that come from the sample from our data. So I like to remember that population and parameter go to together. They both start with P and sample and statistic go together. They both start with S. So when I said that when we take a sample, it needs to represent the population, um, that's where we come in with representative sample. It's important to have a representative sample, which means that the sample shares all of the same characteristics as the population. So there's not any kind of sampling bias when you're sampling. So for example, if you wanted to know something about the political stance of the United States, um, and then you only surveyed people from Texas to come up with that, 
that would not be a representative sample because we know that in the United States, there are um, several other states that may not align exactly with how Texas aligns politically. So we would want to make sure that we have a, represent a representative sample for the population, and that could be done better by sampling from every single state instead of just sampling one entire state. Um, the variable is the characteristic of interest for each person or object. So what we mean by that is the variable is whatever we're trying to learn about. So if I wanted to know average income of the American family, the variable would be an average income for a particular family or each family. Okay. Numerical value variables are variables that come from numbers and categorical variables are variables that uh, come from things that have labels or names. And then data is the actual values of those variables. So I really like this slide here because it gives a good, um, a good show of the difference between a population and a sample. And so, um, and it also goes over the difference between a parameter and a statistic. So I would encourage you to um, use this slide to help you know the difference between the two. So we're going to do a few examples so that we can get used to using these words appropriately. So determine what the key terms refer to in the following study. We want to know the average amount of money first year college students spend at ABC College on school supplies that does not include books. We randomly surveyed 100 first year students at the college. Three of those students spent $150, $200, and $225 respectively. So um, if we want to know what our population is, our population is the entire group we want to know about. So here it says we want to know the average amount of money first year college students spend at ABC College. So that's going to be our population, all first year college students at ABC College. Now, the sample is a group that we can actually know about. So we usually do a survey or we um, take a, a sampling. And so in this problem, it says they, we randomly surveyed 100 first year students at the college. So our sample here would be the 100 first year students sampled. So our parameter, remember, comes from the population. So it's that idea that we want to know. So we want to know the average amount of money. So we start with that average amount of money. And then we want to clarify by making sure that we say that it comes from our population. So the average amount of money all first year college students spend at ABC College on school supplies other than books or not including books. So the statistic, remember, comes from the sample. So in this case, it's going to start the same way. We're still going to be looking for an average amount of money But instead of writing out what th that it comes from the population, we're writing out that it comes from the sample. So the average amount of money, the 100 students surveyed 
or sampled. Spent on school supplies. Other than books. Okay, the variable here is um, the point of interest. Okay, so the variable comes directly from the parameter and the statistic. So we can see here that both the parameter and the statistic include the part where it says average amount of money. So this is also an average amount of money, but it's for an individual or for each person. So average amount of money an individual student spends on supplies other than books. And then the data is any information that is either numerical or categorical that it could actually be used. So in this sentence where it says three of those students spent and it gives the dollar amount they spent, those are the actual data values. So $150, $200, and $225. Okay. So normally I would give you some time in class to do this problem on your own. Since this is a recorded lecture, I encourage you to pause the recording and attempt this problem on your own. And then when you come back, we can look at the solutions. Okay, so hopefully you paused this and you attempted this problem on your own. So let's talk through the solutions. A study was conducted at a local college to analyze the average cumulative GPAs of students who graduated last year. Fill in the letter of the phrase that best describes each of the items below. So here it says, um, first we want to find the population. And then it says statistic, parameter, sample. I think this ordering can be confusing. So first I'm going to do the population and then I'm going to do the sample. And then using the population in the sample, I can then find the parameter and the statistic. And the reason I'm doing it in that order is so I don't get confused um, because it's so easy to mix up these words. So let's start with the population. Remember, the population is the entire group that we want to know about. So in this case, that would be F all students who graduated from the college last year. So that comes from here where it says a study was conducted at a local college to analyze the average cumulative GPAs of students who graduated last year. So if we're doing a study over students who graduated last year, then we want to know about all students who graduated from the college last year. So then I'm going to go ahead and do sample because it's easier to find the sample um, right after we find the population because we know that we want to choose um, a subset of the population for our sample. So in this case, um, we are also looking for um, something that has to do with the uh, graduated from the college last year. So um, this one here would be D because it says a group of students who graduated from the college last year randomly selected. So that would be um, a subset of the population and the randomization means that it is probably a good subset um, that is representative of the population, okay? So then from there, we need to find the parameter. So the parameter is the, um, it's the value that we're trying to find here. So when it says we conducted the study, we wanted to analyze the average cumulative GPA. So the parameter is gonna be the average cumulative GPA 
when it comes to the population. And the population we know is all students who graduated last year. So the correct answer for this one is G, the average cumulative GPA of students in the study who graduated from the college last year. Oh no, that's not G because of the word in the study, right? This says in the study. So that can't be G because we want to talk about what's to the population when we're talking about a parameter. So let's look again. So here on E, it says the average cumulative GPA of students who graduated from the college last year. So that indicates all students who graduated from the college last year. Um, because it does not specifically say in the study. So for parameter, I would put E, which means the statistics is the G I thought was the parameter before, right? Because of the in the study that we have here. And then the variable, remember, applies to the individual. So um, the variable we're concerned about is GPA, so the cumulative GPA of one student who graduated from the college last year. So that one student is talking about the individual, uh, so our answer is B. And then the data is actual data values. So we see here um, an example of data values are given in C. All right, so this is another problem. And again, you can pause the video if you'd like and attempt this problem, but I am going to work through it now. So as a part of a study designed to test the safety of automobiles, the National Transportation Safety Board collected and reviewed data about the effects of an automobile crash on test dummies. Here is the criterion they used. The speed at which, at which the car crashed was 35 miles per hour. And the location of the driver or the dummy was the front seat. Cars with dummies in the front seat were crashed into a wall at a speed of 35 miles per hour. We want to know the proportion of dummies in the driver's seat that would have had head injuries if they had been actual drivers. We start with this simple random sample of 75 cars, okay? So the population here would be all cars that crashed, right? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, car crashes, right? So all uh, cars crashed. So the sample would be the sample we take of those crashes. So it says we start with a simple random sample of 75 cars. So 75 cars sampled. Okay. So the parameter refers back to the population and the parameter we're being asked about here comes from, comes after what we want to know. So it says we want to know the proportion of dummies in the driver's seat that would have had head injuries. So we want to know the proportion of head injuries, okay? Or we could put proportion of all head injuries, okay? And then the statistic is the portion of, from the sample, it comes from the sample. So we would say the proportion of, head injuries from the 75 cars sampled. So the variable here would be um, an individual with a head injury. Really, we should say that more neutral because we don't know if they have a head injury or not. That's the variable is they either could or couldn't have in, a head injury. So let's say an individual 
um, let's say if an individual has a head injury or not. So in this case, our data is going to be categorical because either they have a head injury or they do not have a head injury. So I would say that your data should fall as yes or no. There are a lot of ways to indicate yes and no when we're doing statistical studies. Um, a lot of scientists like to use ones and zeros, ones for yes and zeros for no's. Um, that helps so that you can do a numerical evaluation on categorical data, um, but that's a little outside the range of this course. So for now, we'll just keep it as categorical data for yes and no. All right. And so this is the last example of this type. So again, if you'd like to pause your video and attempt this problem, you can do so. And now I will work through this problem as well to ensure that you have the correct answers so you can self-correct after you've attempted the problem. An insurance company would like to determine the proportion of all medical doctors who have, in, who have been involved in one or more malpractice lawsuits. The company selects 500 doctors at random from a professional directory and determines the numbers in the sample who have been involved in a malpractice lawsuit. So the population here would be all doctors in all medical doctors who have been involved in a malpractice in malpractice, right? Because it's the entire group we want to know about. So all medical doctors So all medical doctors who have been involved in malpractice would be the population, okay? The sample would be the um, selected 500 doctors. So um, here we would say the 500 doctors selected Um, who have been involved in malpractice. Okay. So the parameter would be, let's see, the parameter, let's let's change this because again, I'm getting, um, the parameter and the statistic kind of jumbled up with the population in the sample. So let's see, let's just say all medical doctors, okay? Because we don't know yet if they were involved in malpractice or not. So let's just say all medical doctors. And so then the sample would be the 500 doctors selected right? The 500 doctors selected. There we go. That is better. Now it'll be easier to determine the parameter and the statistic. So the parameter is the proportion of all medical doctors who have been involved in malpractice. So that is the, that is the parameter. So the proportion And so the statistic would be um, the same, the proportion, but coming from the 500 doctors we selected or the sample. So this would be the proportion of doctors involved in malpractice from the 500 
sample. Okay. So then again, the variable goes back to um, the individual. So we're going to say the variable is um, with if an individual doctor has been involved in malpractice. Okay. And then the data um, would be categorical in this problem as well, because either they have been involved in malpractice or they have not been involved in malpractice. So the next idea that comes from 1.2 is the idea of categorizing data. So it's important to put, um, to define data in different manners. It helps us determine what kind of tests we wanna do on data, what kind of graphs are appropriate for representing the data and so on and so forth. So the two starting things that you always wanna start with when you're talking about data is whether it's qualitative or quantitative data, okay? So qualitative data, also called categorical data, are data that could be labeled or named. So that an example of this would be like um, the yes or no that we did on any yes or no question, right? It could also be um, your favorite color because that's a word, right? Whatever your favorite color, you can name that. You can label your favorite color. Um, it does not have a numerical value. Quantitative data or numerical data are data that are indicated by number where the number has a numerical representation. So for example, um, that would be like your salary, okay? So that would be a numerical data or quantitative data. Now, one thing we have to take into consideration here is that there are situations where we have qualitative data that are numbers. So example of qualitative data that use numbers to label would be things like um, zip codes, right? Because the zip code represents an area, but the zip code itself, the number portion of the zip code does not have a numerical value. It is just a representation. Same thing with like social security numbers and um, seat numbers at like an auditorium things like that. They're labels, but the labels does not represent actual numerical data. The next step is if you've decided that you have quantitative data, there are two types of quantitative data, discrete and continuous. And how we like to remember this is discrete data is counting. So it's like um, anytime you see the words, the number, okay, the number is a telltale sign that you are counting something, which means the data is discrete. So the number of siblings you have or the number of classes you're taking or anything that you can count, right? Continuous data is data that usually comes from measurements. And so that would be anything like the time it takes you to run a race or um, your weight in kilograms or anything like that. So it's measurements. So um, discrete and continuous, these ideas of counting and measurements come directly from whether a numerical system is discrete or continuous.
So here's a visualization that can help you. Um, I like I like this visualization because it helps me realize, okay, first I want to decide qualitative or quantitative. If it's qualitative, it's just descriptive and labels. If it's quantitative, it's numerical, but there's two types of numerical quantitative data, discrete and continuous. Discrete is counts, continuous is measurements. So here we're going to label the data. The data are the number of books students carry in their backpacks. You sample five students. Two students carry three books, one student carries four books, one student carries two books, and one student carries one book. The number of books are three, four, two, and one. So when it says the number of books, that automatically, that number should let you know, okay, it's quantitative because we're talking about a value, a numerical value. And because it says the number, it indicates a count. So that would be quantitative discrete. Quantitative discrete data. The data are the weights of backpacks with books in them. You sample the same five students, the weights in pounds of their backpacks are 6.2, 7, 6.8, 9.1, 4.3. Notice that the backpack carrying three books can have different weights. Weights are, so here, this data, we know it's numerical data, so we're gonna say quantitative. And weights is a type of measurement, right? So this would be continuous. You go to the supermarket and purchase three cans of soup. A 19 ounce tomato bisque, 14.1 ounce lentil, and 19 ounce Italian wedding. Two packages of nuts, four different kinds of vegetables, and two desserts. 16 ounce pistachio ice cream and 32 ounce chocolate chip cookies. Name data sets that are quantitative, discrete, quantitative, continuous, and qualitative. So in this information, there are lots of different sets of data that can be labeled in different ways. So for example, Quantitative discrete would be counts of things. So that would be like the number of soups or the number of nuts or the number of kinds of vegetables. Or the number of desserts. Quantitative continuous would be measurements. So that would be like the 19 ounces of tomato bisque. Or 14.1 ounces of lentils. Or 19 ounces of Italian wedding. It could also be the 16 ounces of ice cream or the 32 ounces of chocolate chip cookies. And then qualitative data is data that has labels. So that could be um, the types of soup. The types of nuts. The types of veggies. And the types of desserts. The data are the color of backpacks. Again, you sample the same five students. One student has red backpack, two students have black backpacks, one student has a green backpack, and one student has a gray backpack. The colors are red, black, black, green, and gray. 
So here, because we're talking about colors, colors are not numbers, right? They're labels. This would be qualitative data. Okay. All right, so I would encourage you to pause the video and attempt these problems here. They're just labeling the types of data, just like we've done on the last um, four examples. So just for each one, you would say whether it's qualitative, quantitative discrete, or quantitative continuous. So hopefully you paused the video and now you're ready for me to walk you through these. The number of pair of shoes you own. So we know it's a number because it says the number. So we know it's quantitative. And because it says the number, it means we are counting. So the number of pairs of shoes. So we're counting how many pairs of shoes. So that would be discrete. The type of car you drive, that would be Qualitative, right? Because if we're talking about a type of car, we are going to label the car. It would be something like um, whether it's a Hyundai or a Honda or a Toyota or whatever. Those are different types of cars. The distance from your home to the nearest grocery. Well, we know distance is a measurement that uses numbers, right? So this would be quantitative continuous because it is a number and distance is a form of measurement. The number of classes you take per school year. So again, that would be quantitative discrete because the um, portion that says the number lets you know, A, you're using numbers, so it's quantitative, and B, um, it is a count because you have a total number of classes. The type of calculator you use. This would be a qualitative data set, right? Because the type of calculator would be like a TI or a Casio or whatever. Weight of sumo wrestlers. So this would be quantitative because we know we represent weight with numbers. So quantitative continuous because weight is a type of measurement. Number of correct answers on a quiz. So again, that number here tells you that you're talking about a count. Um, so we're going to have quantitative discrete. And then an IQ score. So an IQ score a lot of times could be, um, it really depends on how the set test is set up. So an IQ score um, usually is numerical without any um, decimals. So that would make it discrete. But an IQ score could also be um, continuous if you could get a score such as um, 145.5. So anything that has a decimal would be considered continuous, whether it's a measurement or not. IQ scores could be considered a measurement of um, intelligence. So that would lead you to think that it's continuous. Or an IQ score could be thought of any other, like any other test where you have a certain number of problems and you get them right or wrong. And in that case, it would be discrete. So um, it could be chosen as either in this case, which also means that it's quantitative data. So I would take either. All right. So there are different types of graphs that represent different kind of data better than other graphs. So in this case, we're looking at a pie chart. Pie charts are usually used to represent qualitative data. So it goes to show that we have our different labels and then a portion or a piece of the pie is dedicated to that label. Um, and so that is best used for qualitative data. 
This data here is quantitative data because we can tell that not only do we have um, credit hours completed here, but we have the number of students that can completed that. So it is definitely a count, right? So this would be quantitative discrete. So this is called a histogram, right? So a histogram is usually for quantitative data. Below are tables comparing the numbers of part-time and full-time students at two colleges enrolled for spring 2010 quarter. The table displays counts or frequencies and percentages or proportions, which are called relative frequencies. The columns make, make comparing the same categories in the college easier. Displaying percentages along with the number is often helpful, but it is particularly important when comparing sets of that data that do not have the same totals, such as the total enrollment for both colleges. Notice how much larger the percentage of part-time students at Foothill, Foothill College is compared to De Anza College. So the idea here is that you can take two separate samples or two separate groups and make a comparison. And while um, the frequency, which is the count or the number, might um, vary a little, it is much easier when they don't have the same kind of numbers to look at their percentages or their relative frequencies to make comparisons from data set to data set. So when we're looking here at this, we can see that this one is not as evenly divided as this one. So this goes over the best types of graphs that are um, used for qualitative data. So for qualitative data, you're looking for pie charts, bar graphs, and Pareto charts. Pareto charts is when we, um, it's a special type of bar graph where the bars are sorted into order by size. So here are some examples of um, how to classify that last data set we took a look at in different ways of um, viewing it. So here is in a pie chart. Here is a histogram that looks at the frequency. Oh, I'm sorry, bar graph, not histogram, bar graph that looks at the frequency. And here is um, another bar graph that looks at the, this time the bar graph's looking at the relative frequency because of the percentages. And this is kind of misleading here because right here it says that the total is 150.5. That's really confusing um, when we have data that shows up um, past 100% because it makes it look like um, we have more than 100% to consider and that can be kind of misleading. So we want to make sure that we don't, we don't do that. Um, we want things to add up to 100%. So in this data here, we can see that we're looking at um, ethnicities or races. Um, but what I want you to realize is that this total right here on both of these are less than the total number of people who participated. So here we have 22,444 out of 24,322. That means there's about 2,000 people that we're not counting or not displaying information about, which can be misleading. And the same thing here when we're talking about percentages, since percentages come from these frequency numbers, we can tell that we're only representing 90% of the population that we're talking about here or the sample that we're talking about here. And 
that means 10% isn't even being considered or showing any information about it. And that is a problem. That's very misleading. And we want to avoid being misleading with our graphs and with our data. So here, this is what it looks like when you graph the information that was given. But this graph makes much more sense because it has that 10% of data that we were missing before. So if you go back between the two and you add these values up, you're going to get that 90%. Whereas if you add these values up, you're going to get 100%. And so your values for a uh, bar graph that show cumulative frequency or, I mean, relative frequency or frequency should add up to the total who participated or 100%. And then this is a Pareto chart that shows you. So it's a bar graph. Um, it look, It's the same information that's here, but you can see in a Pareto chart, it's organized in a way that you can see from, least, from greatest to least, which is um, often a good way to do it so that you can see and compare values fairly easily and quickly. Now, here, we have all the data in both of these pie charts, but the pie charts look very different, right? So in pie chart B, um, it probably draws your eye more. And that's because in, in pie chart A, it's very hard to compare the different pieces of pies because they're all scattered about here. But on this pie chart in B, it's a lot easier to compare the different sizes of pie because they're um, they are uh, consensual to size. So like we have the largest piece here and then the next largest, the next largest. And so it gets smaller and smaller as we cut it around. So B would be the better way to sort the data and put the data into a pie chart so that it's easier to read and understand. So um, the next idea we're gonna cover in chapter one is sampling. So sampling is very important. It's important to sample correctly when you take a sample from the population to, event, to avoid biases that can occur when sampling. So a couple of things you should know is a sample should have the same characteristics as the population it represents. So this is really important, okay? This is often accomplished by random sampling, okay? So randomizing your sample is how this is accomplished. Now, simple random sampling is when every member of the population has the exact same chance of being selected as every other member of the population. And that's important. We wanna make sure that we um, are taking random samples when we are sampling. That's the best way to, most ethical way to sample data. So there are different types of sampling that we're gonna talk about. So these are the four types we're gonna cover in this class. Um, but I am going to go over them um, with pictures because, again, I don't care if you can recite a definition to me. I care that you understand what that definition means and you can figure it out in a scenario. So we're going to look at these with pictorial representations. So simple random sample is where you have the entire population included. So like a bingo card, all of the balls you could get, every number you could get on a bingo card has a ball. And those balls are put in this spinner. And then you randomly select from turning the spinner, right? So that would be an example of simple random sampling. The next type of sampling is stratified. So that's when the entire population is broken into subgroups. So in this case, the population would be like a college or a high school, and it's broken into four subgroups, the freshman class, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And then you sample the same number from each one of those classes. So you still sample two. So in this case, we sampled two from each class. That's called stratified. A cluster sample um, is 
similar to stratified, but a little different because in stratified, we took the same amount from every group, but in cluster, we take the population and we divide it into subgroups, but instead of taking the same number from each subgroup, we're choosing whole subgroups out of those, um, out of that population that's that's been put into different subgroups. The next is systematic sampling, and it's the one that students usually get right the most because all you have to remember is it's talking about the nth member. So this is like every 100th customer that comes in gets a free coffee or whatever it might be. Um, in this case, we do it in quality control quite a bit. Every fourth bottle gets to be tested. Um, every 10th piece of pipe gets to be analyzed, whatever it might be. And then the one that I would say is probably the least appropriate sampling method is the kind we see on advertisements all the time, right? Where we have like three different types of juice and random people off the street walk up and try the different juices and decide which one's the best. So those would be convenient sampling. It is purely convenient for the researcher to do this type of sampling. Um, so it's not necessarily a great way to sample. It's just an easy way to sample. So when we're sampling, we want to avoid sample errors. Sample errors are errors that occur during the sampling process. So one way that that can occur is if um, there is natural variation that results from the sample being particularly large, like from a large population. Another thing could be the method of sampling. It could be the fact that the sample is too small, um, or it could be um, all sorts of things. There's a lot of ways to mess up sampling. So you wanna make sure that you have a relatively large sample and that your sample is representative of your population and that it's been done in a simple random sampling method that is appropriate. Okay. Then there are what then there are things that are called non-sampling errors. Non-sampling errors are errors that occur um, by accident or like not during the sampling process. So for example, if you input data incorrectly when you're inputting data into the computer system, that would be a non-sampling error. Um, other things would be like human error. If um, I was asking you a question and I wrote down the wrong answer that you gave me for that question, that would be um, a non-sampling error. So anything like that. And then sampling bias occurs her um, because not all members of a population are equally likely to be selected. So sampling bias happens when um, you don't give everybody a fair chance of being sampled. And so we want to avoid that. So um, here, this slide talks about critical evaluation. So the critical evaluation is really the part that you would use if I asked you, if I gave you a study and asked you, okay, is this study a good study? Should you believe the statistics that's produced by this study? And you would be able to look at that study and um, go through it and make sure that the following things are appropriate or else the study should not be considered as a valid study. So let's look at these things. Problems with sampling. So you should look at how they sampled, what sampling method they use, whether they had a relatively large sample that they use. Did they sample more than once? Did they take more than one sample to make sure that there's variation in the sampling? Um, those are great questions to be asking when you're analyzing a study. And then self-selected samples. You should really worry about people who choose to respond to some situations. So what we mean by that is people have different characteristics. For example, let's say that you sent out an email to the entire faculty and you wanted everybody in the faculty to respond but you didn't make it mandatory. It wasn't required. It was just um, a self-response survey. In that case, um, 
People who fill out the surveys probably have a lot of characteristics in the same. They could um, have the same amount of time in their office to sit and answer the survey or other things like that. They could be more equipped at computers. It, it could be a lot of things. But you are disqualifying people who choose not to participate in the sample. And that can be um, a difficult thing. Again, sample size issues is important to realize. Um, you want an adequately large sample. And um, a lot of times that can be difficult in studies just from, just from the way things fall sometimes and because of different biases that have occurred over history. So for example, if I wanted to do a study over um, females in mathematics classes um, or mathematic majors, females and mathematic female majors, we know from history that women have uh, shied away from mathematics due to different biases they, they have experienced and different conditioning they have experienced over several generations. So for example, um, if I wanted to do this kind of study, I would need a fairly large sample, which means that instead of sampling like from one college of the number of female math majors, which, for instance, if we have 20 math majors here and three of them are female math majors, three is not a large enough sample size. So then I would requ be required to choose a sample from other colleges as well. So I would need a much bigger population, much bigger sample to make sure that the sample was adequate. Then we have what's called undue influence. Undue influence is what happens when people question other people. So for example, um, if your doctor walked in and your doctor was like, I really, I'm really worried about you. Um, your test scores, on your uh, vitamin levels have me concerned about your energy. Um, so how are you feeling? You might respond one way, like, oh, well, if my test scores say that my energy level should be low, I mean, yeah, I kind of have a low energy. But then if your doctor had walked in and had said something like, so how are you, how's your energy level being? And there's no biases at the very front. There's no prepping. The tone of his voice isn't as sad. You might be like, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. So as a result of human nature, humans want to say the correct answer when they're asked a question. And we get cues from other humans by their body language, voice inflection, and things like that, that let us know what the right answer should be in particular situations. So we want to avoid undue influence. No response or refusal of subjects to participate. So sometimes when you do a study, participants will drop out or they won't respond to a particular part of the study or whatever that might be, that can um, cause some error. Causality. A causality is a relationship between two variables. What we need to understand is that causality and correlation are not the same thing. Just because two variables are correlated does not mean that one variable caused the other variable. Self-funded or self-interest studies. So this would be like if you, um, you should always look at where the money comes from. If you're evaluating a study, you should see who funded that study. Because if, um, for example, if, a, if you wanted to know whether a diet program really worked or not, and the person who funded the diet uh, research was an individual who owns stock in that particular diet supplement, you would probably be concerned with the kind of results that would happen because inevitably, if they're funding it, they have a, they have an influence on how the data is presented. Okay? Mislead, misleading use of data. So a lot of times, um, this happens a lot in marketing and it happens a lot on the news. It's where we use the data, but we don't use it correctly. So that would be like 
using the wrong type of graph to show the data or not putting certain information into the graph. So the data is misleading, like what we looked at when we looked at the example that had the ethnicities and races. And we were talking about um, how there was 10% that was completely missing, 10% of the the sample was missing and that was a problem, right? So the same thing here, you can mislead people with your data. And then confounding. Um, the confounding is when the effects of a multiple factors um, have an, uh, an effect on your response variable. So what we mean by this is like, for example, if I was gonna design a study to test a weight loss supplement, like, like I was just talking about a weight loss supplement, I would want to make sure that I made an account for all the different variables that could affect weight loss other than that supplement, right? So I would want to make sure that everybody who was in the study was on the same diet. I would want to make sure that they all had the same exercise program. I would want to test all of their hormones beforehand. I would want to make sure that I thought of every single thing that could affect the weight loss other than the response variable or the, um, the uh, test variable. And that would be the supplement. And so confounding occurs when more than one factor is affecting the outcome of a result. And we like to account for confounding as much as possible. So um, here we're just going to look at this and um, get an idea of what is happening with the sampling method. So we're gonna look at this and determine which sampling method is being used. So a sample of 100 student, 100 undergraduate San Jose State students is taken by organizing the student's name by classification, freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior, and then selecting 25 students from each. So in this case, this would be stratified because we're taking the entire group and we are dividing it into subgroups and then taking the same number of individuals from each subgroup. B says, a random number generator is used to select a student from the alphabetical listing of all undergraduate students in the fall semester. Starting with the students, every 50th student is chosen until 75 students are included in the sample. So this with the 50th should automatically scream to you systematic. A completely random method is used to select 75 students. Each undergraduate student in the so small the fall semester has the same probability of being chosen at any stage of the sampling process. So this would be simple random, right? Because it's just some kind of random method, but everybody has the same probability of being chosen. The freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior years are numbered one, two, three, and four, respectively. A random number generator is used to pick two of those years. All students in those two years are in the sample. So this would be cluster, right? Because we take this, we're doing that, so the same thing of dividing into subgroups, but instead of taking the same number from each subgroup, we're choosing whole subgroups to be part of our sample. And then E here says an administrative assistant is asked to stand in front of the library one Wednesday and, and to ask the first 100 graduate, undergraduate students he encounters what they paid for tuition in the fall semester. Those 100 students are the sample. So this one would be convenience, right? Because they're just standing outside and whoever walks by is the most convenient person to ask. All right, so I would encourage you to pause and um, work through this one and then come back to get the answers and explanations. So pause your video now. All right, now that we're back, let's get started. A soccer coach selects six players from a group of boys aged eight to nine. Seven players from a group of boys aged 11 to 12 and three players from a group of boys aged 13 to 14 to form a rec recreational soccer team. So what I want you to realize this here is that 
a lot of people might be like, oh, well, that's cluster or that's stratified because of the dividing into subgroups. But what I want you to realize is that he's not selecting the same number and he's not selecting an entire group from the subgroups. So this six players, eight players, seven players, three players. So I would say this would be none. This is not any type of sampling method we have talked about. Okay. So B, a pollster interviews all human resource personnel in five different high-tech companies. Okay. So in this case, this would be stratified. Yeah, no, no, no. This would be cluster. There we go. This would be cluster because we know there are more than five high tech companies, but we've chosen five high tech companies and we're asking every single person from those companies. Okay. A high school educational researcher interviews 50 high school female teachers and 50 high school male teachers. So this type would be um, stratified. And that's because we have divided into two subgroups and we've chosen the same number of people from each subgroup. All medical researchers interviews every third, oh, a medical researcher interviews every third cancer patient from a list of cancer patients at a local hospital. So this third, right, would be systematic. A high school counselor uses a computer to generate 50 random numbers and then pick students whose name correspond to the numbers. So this is the same as um, simple random sample, right? Because a computer is generating the numbers and then whatever number is associated with that student's name, they're a part of the sample. A student interviews classmates in his algebra class to determine how many pairs of genes a student owns on the average. So this would be convenience, right? This is convenient for the researcher because he's just talking to his classmates. All right, so let's look at this example. Suppose ABC College had 10,000 part-time students. We are interested in the average amount of money a part-time student spends on books in his fall term. Asking all 10,000 students is almost impossible. Suppose we take two different samples. So we're gonna look at these two sampling methods. First, we use convenience sampling and survey 10 students from a first-time organic chemistry class. Many of these students are taking first-time calculus in addition to organic chemistry classes. The amount of money they spend on books is as follows. The second sample is taking using a list of senior citizens who take PE classes and taking every fifth senior citizen on the list for a total of 10 senior citizens. They spend the following amount of money. So it's unlikely that any student is in both sample. So we're told that it would be unrealistic. So do you think either of these samples is representative of the entire 10,000 part-time student population? And here I would say, no, it would not be because um, science textbooks um, might be more expensive than the cost of other uh, materials. And so, we, if we're just looking, we're just taking a convenience of people who are enrolled in a science class or a math class, that is not a good representation of everybody, right? Because um, a novel that you have to read for English is not near as expensive as a textbook you need for mathematics, right? So just um, dividing it up by different subgroups is kind of an issue here without taking a whole consideration of uh, the other subgroups. So then here, the next one says, it's looking at very specific senior citizens, right? Well, senior citizens probably are not the majority of the types of students that are taking part-time classes. Um, and so that would be misleading as well. C, 
since these samples are not representative of the entire population, is it wise to use the results to describe the entire population? The answer here would be no. We always want to have a representative sample of our population. If they are not a representative sample, they are not a good sample and they shouldn't be used. Now suppose we take a third sample. We choose 10 different part-time students from the discipline of chemistry, math, English, psychology, sociology, history, nursing, physical education, art, and early childhood development. We assume that these are the only disciplines in which part-time students at ABC College are enrolled and that an equal number of part-time students are enrolled in each of the disciplines. Each student is chosen using simple random sampling. Using a calculator, random numbers are generated and a student from a particular discipline is selected if he or she has a corresponding number. The student spends the following amount. Is this sample biased? So I would say that this probably is not a biased sample because it has a very large sample size um, and because they, uh, we would want a pretty large sample size. It doesn't say here what the sample size is, but we're looking at all disciplines, right? So everybody in every discipline has the same opportunity to be chosen. And it says the disciplines are relatively the same size. So that leads me to believe that this is unbiased. The next thing we're going to talk about is levels of measurement. So levels of measurement come back to that classification of data. So we have classified before if data was qualitative or quantitative. And we can do this first, and that will narrow down the measurement types it could be, because qualitative data is either nominal or ordinal, and quantitative data is either interval or ratio. So let's talk about some examples. Nominal level of measurement are things that you can just name. So things like favorite color or um, uh, what school you went to, what high school you went to. So it's just a label. You're just naming something, right? Ordinal is still categorical data. It's still qualitative data. You're naming things, but this time it indicates that some kind of order is occurring. So, for example, if I asked you to list your three favorite shows, right? If I ask you to list your three favorite shows, then you would be able to be like, okay, yeah, so three favorite shows. Okay, cool. And you would list them, but you would put them in order, probably from your favorite to your least favorite or your least favorite to your favorite, right? You're ordering them. And then uh, something like um, ordering songs on a CD or on a playlist. You are ordering those. Now, whether the specific order is important or not, that, that is up to you, but you are ordering things. So that would be ordinal. So then um, the next types are quantitative data. So we have interval and ratio. And when I'm trying to decide between whether something is interval or ratio, I always ask my question, my myself one question. And that question is, what does zero mean? So I have two answers. Zero is either a placeholder, which means that it doesn't particularly mean the absence of anything. It just means that it holds a particular place, whereas ratio means that zero is an absence of something. So if you get zero, it means it did not occur or it is not there, right? So examples of interval would be like temperature. So if you have zero degrees, that's just a placeholder, right? Because it doesn't mean the absence of temperature. There's still a temperature. It's just that temperature is labeled as zero degrees, right? And then ratio, zero means the absence of something. So that would be like um, the time it takes to run a mile. Or let's just say race times to make it easy. Race times. 
If you had a race time of zero, that means you didn't compete, right? It would be the absence of competing. So that is how we determine between interval and ratio. So we briefly went over frequency, frequency, relative frequency, um, and we didn't talk about cumulative relative frequency. But remember, frequency is just the count. So how many times that data value occurs? Relative frequency is made up from the frequency, so the count, over the total, okay? So it's a proportion or percentage. Cumulative relative frequency is taking the relative frequency and keeping a running total. So this is a running total of relative frequency. Okay, and so we use these a lot when we use frequency tables. So let's take a look at this frequency table here. The table below represents the heights and in inches of a sample of 100 male semi-professional soccer players. So we have their heights. This is often called the class. We'll talk about that more in chapter two. Then we have the frequency, which is how many people um, were in between those heights in each class. Then we have the relative frequency where we compare the frequency for that class to the total number of people that we surveyed. And then we have the cumulative relative frequency where we keep a running total of um, the relative frequency. So we're saying, okay, well, the first total is just whatever the five is. And this is really helpful for things like if I asked, um, what proportion is less than uh, or what percent is less than 65.95, then I know, okay, I just have to look at the cumulative relative frequency because I've added up to this point. So anything less than 65.95 would fall under, which means I can use this 23%. Okay, so a lot of times we use frequency tables to answer questions. I'll also tell you, you will often see frequency tables with percents instead of decimals or fractions um, when we're talking about relative frequency or cumulative relative frequency. So it's important to remember that if you are asked something about a percent, the way you get from a decimal to a percent is by moving your decimal places to places to the right. So move decimal two places to the right. So for example, that means that if I want to know the percentage here, I would move this decimal place two places to the right, and so it would be 5%, okay? If you want to go from a percentage to a decimal for whatever reason that might be, if you wanna go for, from a percentage to a decimal, you would then, um, move the decimal two places two places to the left so move decimal two places to the left so that's just an important refresher so let's take a look Find the percentage of heights that are less than 65.95. I swear I did not realize that that was the example when I gave that example before, but we can see here anything that's less than 65.95 would be the cumulative frequency, relative frequency. So that would be 0 0.23. If we want the percentage, that is 23%. So here we get 23%. This one says, find the percentage of heights that fall between 61.95 and 65.95. So now we're looking at between. So between 61.95, so everything that's greater than 61.95 would be here. And below 65.95 would be everything that's less than here. So these are 3% and 15%. And since we want just what's between these two, we need to add those relative frequencies. So 3% plus 15% is 18%. 
Here, use the height of 100 male super semi-professional soccer players in table 1.8 to fill in the blanks and check your answers. So here, you're just going to go back and read those, um, be able to read the table. That's what you're being asked to do here. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answers for these. You can um, check your answers against the answers that I'm giving here, but I just want to make sure that you have the correct answers when you look back at this problem. Um, I'm not going to switch back and forth and answer every question here. I feel like you probably know how to read a table. If you struggle with this and you have specific questions, you can always email me. And then what kind of data are the heights? Remember, heights are measurements. So this is quantitative continuous. And describe how you could gather this data so that the data are characteristics of male super semi-professional soccer players. So here there's lots of ways that you could do it. Um, you could take the same number of players from each team. You could ra randomly select um, a whole through two out of, you know, a hundred teams or, or 10 out of a hundred teams or whatever. So there are different sampling methods that would work here. So your answers for F could vary. This one says 19 people were asked how many miles to the nearest mile they commute to work each day. The day, the data air, the data are as follows, 2, 5, 7, 3, 2, 10, 18, 15, 27, 10, 18, 5, 12, 13, 12, 4, 5, and 10. Table 1.10 was produced. So that's on the next slide. It says, is the table correct? If it is not correct, what is wrong? So if we go and look at this table, and we switch back and forth, I can see off the tip the table is wrong somewhere because I have a two in my raw data set, but there is no two listed as a data here. So I know something's wrong with this table. So if I wanted to correct this table, I would probably do it in Excel or, you know, you could do it by hand, but we're going to take this opportunity to do it in Excel to give you an idea of what you would do on your Excel homework um, that you're going to have for chapter one. So I'm gonna go here and I've already typed in the data that we're gonna use into an Excel document. That's just so it's smoother for us to be able to create these. So I'm gonna create the entire table. So the first thing I'm gonna do to create the table is um, write down what I need. So I need the data value, I need the frequency, um, we've also been talking about relative frequency. And we've been talking about cumulative relative frequency. So those are the different categories I'm going to put in my table. Let me just uh, organize my table. So the first thing I need to do is organize my data from least to greatest so that it's easier to see the data values that appear and how many times they appear. You can do this easily in Excel by highlighting the data you want to sort and go over to sort and filter. And then you can choose to do sort from smallest to largest or largest to smallest or some other kind of sorting. We're gonna just sort from smallest to largest. Now we can clearly see the data values and how many there are of each. So we have two twos, so two datas, and the frequency is two. So then the data three occurs once, the data four occurs once, the data five occurs three times, the data seven occurs twice, the data 10 occurs three times. The data 12 occurs twice. The data 13 occurs once. 15 occurs once. 18 occurs twice. 
and 20 occurs twice. Now I'm just gonna total this up right here just so that I can make sure I didn't miss any data values. If I didn't miss any data values, my total should equal 19, right? So to total, I would just put equal sum so that it would um, add it for me. And then I highlight the, the uh, cells that I want to be um, added together. And then I end with a parenthesis. Oh, I made a mistake somewhere, right? So I have two, two, three, four. So three fives. Oh, I made a mistake on the last one, right? I put a two when it should have been a one. Then click enter, it changes it to 19. Perfect. All right, so relative frequency. Remember, relative frequency is when you take the frequency and put it over the number, uh, the total number of values. So this can be done fairly easily just by doing equals. You choose the cell the frequency is in. And then you divide by the total number. Well, we know our total number is 19. So we click enter. And then we can copy this and highlight the other column or the other rows. And we can do this formula, uh, Fx here that you see. And we can paste and it will, you'll see that it does the same thing for each one of these. So let me show you. So like here, we have E2 divided by 19, so frequency divided by 19, E3 divided by 19, down here, E10 divided by 19. So you see that's occurring. Now, this is a lot of decimal places, which can be confusing. So I'm going to take these decimal places, and I am going to um, decrease the number of decimal places. I can do this by doing this. Um, this is the button that I'm clicking up here where the mouse is. Um, let's do four decimal places. That makes it a little easier to read. It's not as overwhelming from those long decimals. Okay. So then remember, cumulative relative frequency comes from the frequency. So I'm just going to put equals whatever this first one here is. And I'm going to click enter. And then here, I'm going to put equals. And I'm going to choose the frequency we had from above. And I'm gonna add the new frequency for that value. And I'm gonna click enter. If I do that, I can then copy and go highlight here, do the same thing. And you'll see it starts keeping a running total. I'm gonna change these as well to smaller decimal places. Okay, perfect. And so, yeah, let's just go to three decimal places. I'm gonna change this one to three too, because th they're just prettier. Okay, so here you can see that the cumulative relative frequency went to one, it totaled to one. And that's because if we changed it to a percent, you can change to a percent fairly easily, just click this percent button, then it changes to a percent, which means that this would be 100% as well if I change to a percent. And we always want our last value to be 100% because that means that we didn't miss any values because cumulative means a running total. And if we have all of the values, then we have a hundred. All right, so let's go answer the questions that we have on our PowerPoint using this information. So answer the following questions. What is the frequency of death? Oh, nope, there we go. True or false, 3% of people surveyed commute three miles. If the statement is not correct, what should it be? If the table is incorrect, make the correction. So we already made the correction on the table, right? So we can change this these relative frequencies to percent as well. And we can see that three miles is represented by three in the data set, and that's 5%, not 3%. Okay, so then what fraction of people surveyed commute five or seven miles? So we want five or seven. Okay, so we want the percentage that commute five or seven. So if we look at five and seven, we have 16% and 11%. If we add those together, we'll get a total of 27%. Next, what fraction of people surveyed commute five, oh, no, we just did that one, 
What fraction of people surveyed commute 12 miles or more, less than 12 miles between 5 and 13 miles, not including 5 and 13? So we could go back here and we could look at each one of those. If we want 12 or more, we could just simply, or 12 or less, or 12 or more, we could add these 12 of these together to get the total. If we want less than 12, we could add these values to get the total. If we want between three or five and 13, not, not including five and 13, we could add these values here. Okay, so it's just using the table to answer questions. That's all we did here. All right, so I am going to go back and fill in those answers for you just so that when you work this problem on your own, you can feel secure that you either got the answers correct or incorrect. And that will um, help build your confidence here, right? So here, this was incorrect. So we did it in Excel to correct it. Here, the answer was false. And we found that it was actually 5%. This one says fraction, so I can go back and count those frequencies and put it over the total. And when I do, I get 5 19 Same thing here, these are asking for fractions. So for 12 miles or more is seven out of 19. Less than 12 miles is 12 out of 19. Between five and 13 miles non-inclusive is seven out of 19. Okay, perfect. So this was the table that was incorrect that we had to correct. All right. So example one, 118. Table 111 contains the total number of death, deaths worldwide as a result of earthquakes for the period from 2000 to 2012. Answer the following questions. What is the frequency of death measured? Uh, what percentage of death occurred, and so on and so forth. So this is the table you're looking at to answer those questions, okay? So these are the years. These are the number of deaths that occurred in each year, okay? So take a look at that and answer these questions. Again, this is just reading a table. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the answers so that when you... Um, work these out and check them, you can make sure that your answers match my answers. Oh, I've been putting them in the wrong places. Let me fix that. This shouldn't be a question, right? It's instructions. says, what kind of data are the numbers of deaths here? Um, we're counting how many people died. So it's quantitative, discrete. Okay. The Richter scale is used to quantify the energy produced by an earthquake. Example of Richter scale numbers are 2.3, 4.0, 6.1, and 7.0. What kind of data are these numbers? So these are measurements. What's happening is the Richter scale is measuring um, the energy that's produced by these earthquakes. So that's quantitative continuous. All right, so again, you can pause here and use this to verify those answers on the previous slide. All right, so um, the last thing you want to do is be able to design an experiment and be able to do it ethically, okay? So there's parts of an experiment that you need to be able to identify. There's the independent variable, which is also often called the explanatory variable. So this would be um, the variable that you're using for your treat, like what you're using for your treatment. So this is often your treatment, okay? Then you have your dependable variable or responsive variable. And so this is the outcome of your treatment. 
So whatever's being affected by your treatment. So for example, if we go back to the weight loss supplement example, I keep going to the treatment here or the explanatory variable here would be the supplement. And then res the response variable would be the weight, what your weight is after taking the supplement, okay? So it's important to realize that we have, um, again, this is reiterating that the treatment is the explanatory variable. And then the experimental unit is the single object or individual to be measured. So a unit is like one person or uh like if you were doing a quality control on steel, one piece of pipe, those would be the units, okay? Additional variables that can cloud a study are called lurking variables. So this goes back to like, if we were trying to do the weight loss supplement study, um, we would wanna account for things like diet and exercise, right? So those would be considered lurking variables. When we're doing some kind of research with a supplement or medication or anything like that, we should have a control group. Um, so the control group is the group that does not get the, um, does not get treatment. Whatever that treatment might be. And then you have a group that does get the treatment, which is called the treatment group. And then the group that is the control group often gets what's called a placebo, and that's to account for the placebo effect. So scientists realized many years ago that if you, um, the power of suggestion is really, really powerful to humans. And so, for example, if you are given this medicine and you're told this medicine will um, make your migraines go away, and uh, cause you to have fewer migraines in a month, if you think that the medicine you're taking will help you, it will actually make you think that it's actually helping. Um, and so that causes a placebo effect, okay? And then we have what's called double blind experiments. This is often used to help with that undue influence so, for example, in medical uh, studies or different studies where you have to interview people and you have to handle, you have to ask them questions and they have to respond, it's important to have a double blind experiment because um, that double blind means that the scientist that they're working with or the researcher they're working with does not know if they're in the treatment group or the control group. And the person who's actually being treated does not know if they're in the treatment group or the control group. And this keeps us from having undue influence, like what we talked about when your voice changes, when you ask a question or your body language and so on and so forth. Um, if it is single blind, single blind is when the researcher does know that the person is in the, which group the person is in, and um, only the subject doesn't know. And then you can have non-blind studies where everybody is aware of what group they're in. So let's take a look at this scenario and um, try to label the parts. The smell and taste treatment and research foundation conducted a study to investigate whether smell can affect learning. Subjects completed mazes multiple times while wearing masks. They completed the pencil and paper maze three times wearing floral scented masks and three times with unscented masks. Participate, participants were assigned at random to wear the floral mask during the first three trials or during the last three trials. For each trial, researchers recorded the time it took to complete the mace and the subject's impression of the mass scent, positive, negative, or neutral. Describe the explanatory variable and responsive variable. So in this case, the ex um, explanatory variable would be the scent, right? We're, we're trying to measure how smell might affect. So it would be the scent. The responsive variable is how quickly they were able to do um, the maze. And so this would be um, time to complete. Okay. Uh, the treatment here would be either a floral scented mask or a non-scented mask.
I guess that would be unscented, not non-scented, right? Unscented. Mask, those would be the treatments, right? Identify any lurking variables that could interfere with this study. So one that comes to mind immediately for me would be like um, perfume. If somebody was wearing perfume, that might have an effect since you are talking about scents. If somebody was cooking food nearby, anything that could throw off the smell in the environment could be a lurking um, variable. Is it possible to use blinding in the study? So in this study, you can't use blinding, right? Because people either know they're smelling something or they're not smelling something, right? And the people who hand out the mask know either the mask smell or that they don't smell. So there's no way to make this a blind study. All right, this concludes chapter one. So you want to make sure that you do your chapter one um, homework through Blackboard and you want to make sure that you do your chapter one Excel homework and get that turned in. And I hope you'll have a great day.